Welcome everybody to the Tuesday, February 12th regular school board business meeting. Um, may we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there uh, any adjustments to the agenda? I actually would like to make a couple of adjustments. Um, one, under, um, under new business, when we, when we come to the, the needs assessment, facility needs assessment, I would like it to include um, the consideration to include the total um, amount um, for the needs assessment um, to be included in the school board budget. Oh, so you want like a, a motion written in? I, I would like a motion to consider um, including the amount, which yeah. I don't have right in front of me, um, into the school board um, FY20 budget. Do you need a motion to inc include it or, or no? no. Okay. So when I read the agenda, I assumed that's what we were going no, to do and that someone here. Yeah. someone would have to come up with a motion, so I appreciate you clarifying because I think having the amount specified to be added to the budget is important for the public The to amount see. and also what we're doing because yes. yep. it doesn't really it doesn't. stipulate it. Right. So thank you. Do we need, uh, do we need to make a, a motion to approve or? Or not. I, I move that we adjust the agenda to include a motion to approve the total number of the facility needs assessment in the school year budget. Okay. The second? I second. Okay, thanks. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. And then the other adjustment, this is pretty minor, um, under uh, 14, uh, under the policies. We have to approve for second reading um, eventually relations with booster groups. It should be it should read J J I B C, not J J I C. And that is it for adjustments, as far as I know. Okay. Um, then we're moving on uh, to a recognition of Bill Gross. Um, although Bill Gross passed away in December, um, the news really didn't come to our attention until after the new year. And we just, as a school board, want to recognize um, and commemorate uh, Bill Gross for all the volunteer hours he spent at the high school um, uh, with the students and with Dr. Efron. Uh, he was very dedicated and passionate about um, what he did and believing in the process of helping students through uh, to achieve um, their best in physics and, and math. And um, I just think it's really important last year. Around this time, we recognized several volunteers um, for their dedication and years spent in the district, and Bill was one of them. So I was very sorry to hear of his passing, and my condolences um, to the family and our best wishes to them. So thank you. Thanks. OK, may I have a motion for approval of school board minutes? I move we approve the school board minutes from the regular business meeting Tuesday, January, January 8th, 2019. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Okay, next we're moving on to comments from our student representatives. <coughs> Thank you for being here. Hi, um, we just have a couple things to talk about today. Um, just 
Sure. Um, so the semester has ended as of two weeks ago, so midterms all wrapped up. And for the most part, students' classes are the same, except for when they take an elective first semester versus second semester. Um, so things are starting to wrap up for that. And then uh, winter sports are starting to come to a close. So state championships, uh, playoffs, and all that stuff are to come. Um, also, I've also we've also noticed this year that um, the school has been like, in, uh, or like many kids or students are starting new clubs um, that involve everyone in the school. Um, so a new one that um, just started in the high school was it's called Best Buddies, and so it um, incorporates students who have um, disabilities and like just makes it inclusive. And I think it's really cool, along with Club Unify. Um, it's just cool to see things like that starting, like including everyone. Yeah, and Club Unified Basketball is also kicking off um, right about now. We were supposed to have a game today, but it got postponed till after um, break, I think. And that is just a basketball team um, that unifies people of all abilities. And so you have partners and you have players, and we play all other teams. And it's treated like a normal basketball game. We have refs, we have fan sections, and it's really it's an awesome um, team to be a part of. Of, so I'm really excited for the season to continue for that. So, yeah. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> I think that's all we have tonight. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, then we're moving along to um, comments from the public. Are there any public mem members who would like to address items on the agenda tonight? Um, then we move on to presentations. First, we have um, welcome Jennifer Kent. Thanks. Jennifer Kent is the executive director of MEA Benefits and Trusts. everyone have a copy? Well, thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. Um, again, my name is Jennifer Ken. I'm the Executive Director of the MEA Benefits Trust. Just a little background before we get into the, um, to the presentation itself. The MEA Benefits Trust is actually a separate unit from the Maine Education Association, although we do work closely together. We are the insurance arm, so we provide um, medical and vision insurance to all the public schools in Maine. We also cover some of the private schools in Maine as well. We have about 68,000 members throughout the state, and that includes employees and their families. It also includes around a little over 10,000 retirees. So um, we're also covering people once they move into the retirement phase. So. I'm going to go through this presentation. Certainly, I would like this to be inclusive, so if you have questions along the way, feel free to just jump in and ask those. And I know we're on a tight time frame, so I'll try to move through it as quickly as possible. So I put together a brief agenda to talk about these are the different things we'll cover throughout the presentation. Um, but I thought we'd start right off with the cost drivers of, this is gonna compare 2017 to 2016 and help you to better understand why you got the rate increase you did for July of 2018. And then we'll talk a little bit about the rating process and how the renewal process works. So again, feel free to ask any questions. So when we look at the cost drivers um, in 2016, CAPE experienced a 17.4% increase in paid claims in 2017 compared to 2016. And that's really why you got the rate increase that you did. So you would receive, I believe, an 8.76% rate increase, which was on the high end of our margins. 
your per member per month, which is essentially how we measure things, your expenditures still remain 3.4% lower than the MEABT average. And if you look at your increases throughout time, up until last year, they've been on the, the low side. So that explains why you're below the MEABT average. Your costs increased across all your service categories, but most notably for your outpatient facility visits. Those were up 39% in 2017, followed by inpatient professional and pharmacy claims. We would rather see claims in the outpatient setting than the inpatient setting. So even though that was a huge increase, it's a better setting than a lot of these services being done on the inpatient side. Your pharmacy spend grew 5% on a per member per month um, average. And that is actually a pretty good um, percentage because we are seeing double digits for some schools where their pharmacies are increasing. You still remain 15.8% lower than the MEABT average. So again, with all the service categories, you're below the MEABT average. It's just last year you had a huge jump um, and claims compared to, I think the prior year you got a 0% increase, or um, let's say a 1.88% increase, so very low. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the medical loss ratio reports. Probably something a lot of you aren't familiar with, but these are reports that are available to the school districts upon request on a quarterly basis. So what do these reports include? Um, they're gonna give you an outline of all of your members. So it's gonna show your active members, plus their families, the retirees that are both in Medicare and non-Medicare, and we'll get to why that's important in a moment. Um, but it, all of this information in a medical loss ratio port, report is de-identified. So there's no way to say, oh, that's you know Sue Jones on that particular line item. It's really all aggregated and it's all de-identified anytime we get into specifics. The loss ratio, which is essentially how we how we look at your what you've paid in premiums against what you've paid in claims. So a break-even point for the MEA Benefits Trust is right around 90%. So 90 cents of every dollar is going to pay for your claims. The other eight to 10% in there is covering administrative costs, paying for certain programs that are associated with the health plan. In the normal group market outside, it's closer to an 85%. So we're much better um, aligned because of our group size where our break even point is much higher. So that's a good thing. We also um, look at high dollar claimants. It used to be that a high dollar claimant was a person who incurred $50,000 of claims in a particular um, year. Really now that level is $150,000. So the report will show members who have total claims exceeding 50,000. But where we're looking at it is really over $150,000. The reason we look at it that way is that for a particular claimant, if they have claims in excess of $150,000, we'll take out the amount above the $150,000, subtract it from your total claims, then do a formula to apply what we call a pooling point, um, and then there's a charge for the pooling. So it's a way of protecting your school district from exorbitant claims. You didn't actually have, um, in 2017, you had four high cost claimants above the $150,000 threshold. So that's pretty, pretty good. Um, and your amounts were not huge. They were maybe, I think the highest was in the $200,000 range. So again, your high class claimants don't seem to be such an issue for your school district. In 2017, you didn't have anybody over the $150,000 threshold, which is pretty unusual. We have some school districts that have members with over a million dollars in claims. So um, that way we take out above the $150,000 and apply a pooling charge is essentially an artificial um, stop loss. So instead of, if we were self-funded, we would contract with somebody to provide stop loss insurance. We're fully insured, so it's, but we act very much like a self-funded group. So we have these kind of artificial 
um, edits within the underwriting program that are really designed to help the school districts. Within the high dollar claimant report, it will say what the status of that member is. So it'll say, are they still active on the plan or are they terminated off the plan? They could be terminated because they've, they've moved, they've um, taken their spouse's insurance, or perhaps they're even deceased. But it's an understanding of, will this person continue to be a high cost claimant? It also gives a primary diagnosis associated with the claim. Not overly specific, but for your group, I can say in 2017, the four high cost claimants above $150,000 were all cancer related. So you do have a lot of cancers within your population. The next part of the report is the retiree classification report. So it breaks out your retirees. It will say how many of your retirees have Medicare and how many retirees don't have Medicare. What's important to look at on that report is how many retirees don't have Medicare because they're still included in your rating. So those could be retirees who haven't reached age 65 yet, or it could be um, the fact that they were never re-eligible for Medicare because they never paid into Medicare. They only paid into Main State Retirement. And there is a population of those for each group. So as we talk about the rating and process, you'll understand a little bit more, but those people that don't have Medicare and that are retirees are still in your experience, which is an important piece to know. Any questions so far? Dry stuff, right? <laughs> Sorry, question. Sure. Did you say the number that were in the high um, claim group for tw 2018, or was I mishearing that? That was 2017. Oh, okay. But you, you said one year we didn't have any. Was that? 2016. Okay. You had zero. Right. So I thought it would be helpful to go through um, the MEABT's rating process. Um, about for s the past six years, we have moved to what we call a modified experience rating model. Um, it used to be, prior to, I believe, 2013, it was a statewide rate increase. So Caribou, we get the same as Cape Elizabeth, the same as York. Um, and then there was legislation that was passed that said each particular school group is entitled to get their own experience. Well, that caused us to react because you can have schools with really good experience and you can have schools with really bad experience. And if all the schools with really good experience decided to go out on their own, that would leave the trust with a bunch of bad experience, which would mean the rates would have to continue to go up at exorbitant amounts. So um, we actually at that time engaged a bunch of consultants, actuaries, underwriters to kind of come up with this modified risk pool. Um, and so essentially, school districts that have 50 or fewer employees plus full-time equivalents or, and retirees are considered to be community rated. So they're too small by state law to experience rate, so they're all kind of put in one group and they receive what we call a community rate. And that's usually around the midpoint of the range of rate increases that we have. School districts that have greater than 50, one or more full-time equivalents plus retirees fall into this modified um, risk pool methodology. And it's considered modified because we actually apply a minimum and a maximum increase to really protect schools that have a bad year of experience from receiving what they might get out on the open market. So what we do next is we look at the MEA Benefits Trust as a whole. So put everybody kind of into the pot, look at that, to try to determine what's gonna be needed for premiums for the next plan year. Once we um, get to that, then we start additional negotiations with our carrier, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield. A lot of things are negotiated ahead of time, certain fixed items. But when we start to get into the renewal, we're really looking at what are they using it for a trend? Does that make sense to us? Um, and we negotiate back on forth because we really want to be as aggressive as possible to make sure that the rate increases you receive are the lowest that they can be. Once we grow through that process, 
then the trust typically buys down the rate from our reserves. So we will look at what that increase is, and we will take money out of our reserves to buy that rate down to also help um, protect you from increases. We determine a minimum and maximum range. So for example, in 20, the past, the plan year we're currently in, it was a zero to 9%. So some school districts received zero, and some school districts received as high as 9%. But the people in the closer to 9% probably warranted a much greater rate increase, and that 9% protected them. The Board of Trustees, which is typically in the, at our March meeting, are presented with what the overall increase is, what we suggest for a buy-down, what the community rate would be, and then the range. After that meeting is when we communicate out to everybody to say the maximum increase for this year will be X. So last year we said it's 9%. And that's to kind of help you um, with your budgets. At that point in time, we don't know what your particular increase is because we had to get through this whole process in order to start the actual school-specific rating. Any questions? I'm sorry, did you say that every year you decide what the maximum is, minimum and maximum? Yes. So we look at kind of what the average is, and we're trying to determine how much is needed in premiums to pay for claims, and we're really forecasting that out 18 months. So it's, I would tell you the spreadsheet is probably as long as this room when you look at it. Um, but yes, we establish that minimum and maximum, and then we fit the schools within there. Is there a cap on the maximum? Yes. Yep, so like last year it was 9%. No, but each like, each year is depends. A, is there a cap? To for, cap to it depends cap. on each year. So the first year we did it, the cap was 13%. Um, it's been as low as 5%. Um, but usually it's in around the 9% um, in, uh, as a max. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. So then we get into the underwriting process. So what we will do when right now, we're just starting the process for July 19 through June 20th. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at incurred claims from January 2018 through December 31st, and then we'll have a one month run out. So they'll be paid, we'll allow for claims to be paid through the end of January. So that just happened. And then that information goes to the underwriters, and that's when they start the whole process. So that's started right now. Um, the first thing they do is they look at the Medicare retirees that are in your poor, uh, population. Those members are enrolled in a product called Group Companion Plan, which is a supplement to Medicare. They instantly pull those members out. So it's pulling them, their claims and also their premiums as well as their, their numbers. Because that product is rated separately because Medicare is primary, so it shouldn't be included in your um, risk. But what is still included are those retirees that don't have Medicare, which is a pretty small portion of the population. So when we look at the claims, we, your renewal is, tip, is essentially January, but you're looking at claims from January through December. So in order to make it a fair process and understanding of looking at a full year of claims, you have to adjust your January through June premiums to what your new July rate is. Because essentially you have to assume that you paid the same rate all year for the claims cost. So it's not penalizing you for your first six months of the year at a different rate. It's bumping the rate up to what you didn't pay, but is what's considered to be um, what you would have expected in a 12 month period if you renewed, say, in January along with your plan year. Does that make sense? So we just adjust those premiums. We look again at the claim amounts, over $150,000 I talked about earlier. We apply a pooling charge, we pull those amounts out. Claims again then trended out for 18 months. There are completion factors that go into these calculations. 
Um, and what they come up with is a total estimated premium needed for July 2019 through June 20th. And this is all done in February of 2019. So it's really trying to look that far out and how much we need for claims. There are credibility factors that are applied. So essentially, the larger the school district, the more credible they are. The smaller the school district, the less credible they are. And all that means is their fluctuations can be greater. Then a rate increase is determined for each particular school district within that minimum and maximum. So once all the different underwriting factors have been applied, it will come out with what, a loss ratio, what the loss ratio looks like and what, you know, where you fall into that, that range. And each rate is a half a percent apart. So it's really narrowing it down very specifically to make sure that you're getting um, a fair assessment. One thing I'll say, and I meant to say it earlier, was that in 2018, you had a 8.76% per per rate increase, very close to the cap of 9%. In the open market, if you didn't have that cap, the underwriting model showed that you should have received a, of course I don't have my glasses on, 19.42% uh, rate increase. So it really saved the district a significant amount um, by having that. Um, the other thing I would mention is last year, your, um, let's see, I wrote it down here someplace. Your medical loss ratio was 89.2%. So you're very close to that 90% break even, which is why you got the increase you did. When I look at your January through December claims, it shows a 97.9% .9 loss ratio. Now you can't base everything on that report because of the other things that I mentioned that go into the underwriting process. That includes your retirees that have Medicare, so those people will be pulled out. The other thing is your January through June premiums are at last year's rate. So that will be adjusted too. So that will help mitigate that. Um, but it is a much higher increase or medical loss ratio number than what you had last year. So that's just something to expect that probably you will be on the higher end um, of whatever that maximum turns out to be for July 2019. We don't have that yet. So as I mentioned, we will have um, all the information to our trustees in March. We'll communicate the day after what that maximum is, maximum is, and then within the next two weeks, we should be able to communicate out to you what your district-specific increase will be for July 2019. We're going to do it in the same fashion we did it last year, which was by email, so you don't have to wait for it to come by um, the U.S. Postal Service, so we will get that information out as soon as we can get it to you. <coughs> Any questions? So I think there was the one bullet I forgot to talk about, and that was um, how much you spend on members with chronic disease. So chronic disease is, you're talking your asthma, diabetes, heart failure, depression, um, and can include migraines. And I forget what page it's on, because of course I didn't put the page numbers on here. but. It was an important figure because it was a little, uh, I guess it's on the cost drivers. The last bullet, you spent over $2 million on members with chronic conditions or 60.2% of your total spend. And we have lots of programs to help members with chronic conditions, from our wellness programs to our condition care programs that really help support members. Um, and it rewards members for participating through gift card incentives. Also, um, it allows people to have their um, condition-specific medications, their co-pays reduced. Also, um, 
doctor's visits, um, certain tests for their condition, we waive the co-pays on and those services are, are free. So there's a lot of programs out there um, that we like to help school districts promote for their population, but chronic conditions is, it's not specific to you. It's every school district in the state has huge numbers here. Um, and the state of Maine as a whole has issues with chronic conditions. So that's where you really can have an impact on your claims is looking at how to best promote the programs we offer. We talk about it in every session we go to. Um, we're always happy if you have an in-service day and you'd like us to talk about wellness or any of our programs, we're more than happy to support you with any of those initiatives. Sure. I do have one follow-up question. Um, so you mentioned uh, it, that we have this range that will be de determined for the schools and in the open market, we might have been looking at a 19% increase. So right. I think that's kind of a critical point that this collar that we enjoy of the range. So in the open market, I don't know if you have this information, but what, what is the range of, of it can increases? Be, there can be increases 30%. Okay. Um, you know, it's fairly rare to have a rate hold or a rate decrease, but mm -hmm. it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, is it can be, there's volatility. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've had really good experience for a number of years and then all of a sudden it hits you. I mean, we have one school district that received the minimum increase, which included decreases for five years. And then mm -hmm. the next two years they got the maximums. They had tons of maternity claims with preemies and high-risk pregnancies, and it really hit them for two years. Right. So um, whether your school district average age is older or younger, you're going to have different things that impact it, but it all has an impact on, on where you land. And one year you can be really bad, and the next year you can be really good. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you beautifully outlined the findings and the missing gaps and explaining to us why things occur. Uh, I was hoping that there would be recommendations, way to save money, way to negotiate, how we can do things better. Do you have anything in that regard? Yeah, and it was, um, it was interesting. The things that drove your costs in 2017 were very random. Um, it wasn't like a, a extreme focus, like you had emergency room visits that increased where we could say you have um, the opportunity to go to a walk-in center instead of an emergency room, or you had a high number of infused drugs. It was kind of all over the board from fractures to infusions to specialty Medicaid. I mean, it was kind of all over the board. Where I would say you can focus is on those chronic conditions and really um, getting people to participate in the wellness programs. Anthem will reach out to people with chronic conditions to participate in the program, and we all do it. The phone rings at night, and you look at your caller ID, and you're like, I'm not picking that, answer, that phone up. But really getting people to say, I'll pick that phone up because it's going to lead me to better health. And it's in conjunction with your doctor. It's run by registered nurses. It's just a couple of phone calls to keep you on a plan, get you um, some goals that you're trying to meet. And then while you're doing it, you get a $100 gift card for going through the assessment, $100 gift card for graduating from the program. And then you get all those other incentives for reducing the cost of your out-of-pocket. So it's like putting money on the ground, but people won't pick it up. <laughs> Is this the same incentive like for City of Portland has it with uh, Aetna, where we as an employee are given incentive to exercise? Yes. To eat well? Is that? That's part of our wellness program. Okay. So we contract with On Life Health, and you have the opportunity to earn $250 in gift cards um, throughout the year um, by participating. And, you know, first of all, is doing a health assessment. So do you um, have the statistic how many people actually for your district? follow? Yeah, for our district. For I can get them? that. I don't have that, but I can get that for you as a follow-up. Okay. Yep. Laura? Yep. Um, so you mentioned that chronic conditions really drove up the rate or one of the... There are big parties spent. It was everywhere. Right. 
And on a lot of these, you see, I see how it compares to 2016, so I see the, the difference in the increase. But it seems like for the chronic conditions, do you have those numbers? Because you had the do. 2017, but I would like to know, you know, what percentage increased from 2016 since it was a contributing factor to we, the... We do have that information. To the cap um, it might be easier for me to send it to you. Yeah, you can send it. For sure. Yeah, I can send it to Catherine. And then um, she can disseminate it. Um, all of those points are very high abbreviated for this presentation. We have a huge report that we um, can provide to um, to Catherine and, and the superintendent that really shows you where your where your costs are. It's right. more specific, um, and I can send that information. I understand a couple of bullet points because it seemed like, hey, everything was all right. You know, you didn't have so much out, you know, inpatient. You had more outpatient. We really were below the averages in most categories. So with the exception, okay, I don't know how compared with the chronic conditions to the averages. Yeah, so and you were still the, chronic condition-wise. Um, for the most part, you were, I would say, kind of below the trust on average. Okay. But because your overall costs in 2017 increased, so even though you're below the trust average, right. your increase... Um, was higher than expected, and so your rates didn't cover it, um, which is what caused the next one, because we didn't want that to repeat. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you had a higher number of costs. We, um, the 2018 data will be out probably in April from a reporting standpoint, um, and if it's something that you'd like us to provide an additional report on your 2018 mm -hmm. earlier, I mean, this is kind of late, because um, we're really talking about 2018 claims for 2019, um, but we could certainly do another report for you and get that out to you sooner um, if you'd like us to. Yes. Thank you. Um, is there a way that, um, and if it's legal or um, appropriate for the school department to um, disseminate information around the wellness programs, it, it might be that people are willing to, you know, read an email and make a phone call versus, you know, looking at the caller ID and saying, yes. I'm not going to answer that. Just, it could be that people aren't aware. It could be oh, that. we do. We do. Yeah. yeah. Arlene puts it out. So you have okay. a wellness ambassador, I believe, here at Cape. Yes. And so what we do um, is we supply the wellness ambassador with all the information to disseminate to employees. Um, when you have a wellness ambassador, we also um, award the school district $500 to use however they want in wellness campaigns um, or incentives, however they'd like to use that. Um, and that will continue um, going forward. It's an annual allotted amount. Um, but, but you do have a wellness ambassador. It does help to disseminate the information. It's just, and I do it myself. Sometimes I don't answer that phone call either. But <laughs> um, it is very helpful to have um, constant communications about these programs because one day it might not matter to somebody, but a week later it could, depending upon what happens in their life. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you again for the opportunity. We're here to support you however we can, um, and certainly feel free to reach out to us, and we would be happy to attend any in service meetings or anything else. Thank you for Great, coming thank tonight. You. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Next on our agenda is we uh, is a presentation from students of Cape Elizabeth High School, starting with Lily and Frame, or or crew. Yes. Is this like a town council where I need to like say my address, or am I? Okay. okay. Just, your uh, just your names. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Lily. I'm Ari. I'm Raina. And I'm Helen. And we are seniors and juniors and sophomore <laughs> at CE at Cape Elizabeth High School. And currently we are doing a lot of work on gender neutral restrooms. So before we begin, Helen has two copies of letters of support we've received. You guys can share that around and 
think you're going to create a Google Doc? Yeah, sorry there are more um, copies. My printer stopped printing out. But if anybody wants to see, have their own copy, then I can make a Google Doc and share it with anybody who gives me their email. Yeah. And, yeah, so she can give those out to whatever two of you want them for right now, and we can just leave them. Yeah. Okay. So what we're aiming to do is on the bottom floor of Cape Elizabeth High School, there are two sets of bathrooms. So that means two different sets of a current male restroom and a current female restroom. They are at different locations. One's by our service entrance, one's more by the main stairwell. And we are looking to change one of those sets into a gender neutral restroom. We've met with Mr. Schwartz to talk about cost assessment. We've had meetings with Ms. Wolfram, uh, Ms. Hubs, Mr. Shedd, various other people to discuss what would make the most sense. And currently we have a survey out to all students, which I will let Ari run through. Um, we So far we have 292 responses and um, the majority of them are for the more centralized um, location of bathrooms there by the main stairwell. Which and is then, by the snack, like yeah. by the concession snack thing, if anyone <clears throat> knows where you go for that. And then the other largest option is for either one. Most students are backing it, but mm -hmm. don't like have a preference. So one thing that we think is super important, and that's been an issue that's been raised a few times, is which bathroom do we choose because of sports events that happen in the gym or shows that happen in the auditorium, because the bathroom that's closest to those is the more centralized location. And I said this a few times, this is going to sound a bit harsh, but I'm sorry. The people who come to shows aren't our priority here. Uh, we want to use the more centralized location because we think that for students, having a more centralized, gender-inclusive restroom brings more awareness to it and makes it easier to access. And for the people who don't want to use them and that come for one show every, you guys are in theater, three months? Yeah. Three months. And in opposition to the 500 students we have six hours a day, five days a week, sometimes more, those, that's not, that's not what should be considered our priority. Our priority should be protecting the students who need the, these bathrooms, of which I've spoken with them personally, and they would also prefer the centralized location. So we think what we spoke with, with Mr. Schwartz, what would make the most sense is not like doing any large changes yet to what the restrooms look like. That can either not happen at all or wait for the needs assessment, kind of whatever you guys think. But right now, it would just be changing the signs on the outside, taking off the ones that have the gendered labels, putting on ones that say gender inclusive, or just whatever. There are a million options. We've seen a bunch of them. We have photos of them. They can be bought wholesale. And that's really what we think is the best option right now. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, we'd love to answer anything. Yeah. What was the survey? What was on the survey? Like, what did you ask? Uh, the survey was Kept three it options. Simple. It was three options. One was a picture of the more centralized bathrooms. One was a picture of the more like in the corner bathrooms, and then one was just either works for me. So, at, at any point, did you ask them? Did you ask your student body? You know, are you okay with? I mean, did you give them an option to say, "I'm not okay with any of this"? Um. With all due respect to the student body, I think that this is definitely a question of taking action for the good of people that might not feel comfortable in gendered restrooms as opposed to asking permission. Um, I think that if we asked that question, that would definitely lend itself to uh, answers that are generally meant to be more funny as opposed to um, being concerned for students. This is also like supposed to make some students comfortable. Um, lastly, I mean, we're not taking away the option to have uh, like a female or a male restroom, so we didn't really feel the need to uh, ask that question on the survey. It's why we did the bottom floor restrooms. There are four restrooms down there that are in two separate locations, two per gender, each right next to each other. So we didn't want to start on one of the other two floors where if we took them away, you'd have to go up or down a floor. We did it on a floor where it would be an easier transition.
even though it would be nice to have them on all floors so that way students who are on the top floor don't have to go down to the bottom floor, but we're willing to do take the baby steps that need to be taken. And when did the survey go out? This morning. This morning, and we've okay. gotten over 200 responses. What are we at? 292. We're at 292, which I'm not exactly sure how many students are in our school district. We have an average, like, 500. <laughs> so over half of the student body has responded. And more coming hourly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, to follow up on uh, Susanna's question, um, it might be useful to survey um, would you use a gender neutral restroom, yes or no, because as a, as a woman you probably know there's often a backlog in the bathroom and, and if you were to narrow the, the audience that, that would potentially be using this restroom, you're going to eliminate a certain number and then create, you want to make sure you're creating a, not creating a situation where you don't have access to enough facilities. So we haven't sent out that survey, but we have, I think a lot of us have just had conversations. We have these conversations pretty regularly. Um, all four of us up here are cisgender, and all four of us are going to plan on using the restrooms, as well as our youth activist group. All people in that group plan on using the gender neutral restrooms as much as possible, just to kind of raise that awareness. And again, there are also two other restrooms that are really you know, I think that a ton of cis people are going to try in these restrooms just so it feels comfortable, so it's not like, oh, that person went into the gender neutral restroom. They must be trans or non-binary or whatever they identify as. We really want to make it just, yeah, here's this bathroom. I have a comment. Um, yeah, so I'm all for the bathrooms and everything like that. Um, just feedback I've heard from students today was just, a sense of lack of information on the bathrooms, and by getting the email, they were a little bit confused and almost shocked on what was going on. And so it, it didn't seem like, a, I don't want to say aggressive in a mean way, but it was almost like, we would like more information on this, we don't feel fully informed about it, and we also kind of want to have a voice in the situation. So I don't know if maybe like an assembly might help that, or maybe going to advisory groups, but I think before anything gets set in stone, I think you guys should definitely talk to the school as a whole, you know what I mean? Not instead of just like the youth activist group and like small groups of students. Yeah, we have a plan. Yeah, okay, so that was sure. uh, the next thing is we're planning on doing a, a short presentation at the school wide assembly. And um, in retrospect, it probably would have been good to do that before sending out the survey questions. We wanted it to try um, and We wanted to have the results for tonight, which is why it happened so fast. But we definitely plan on doing further education with the student body as well as doing Friday assembly and, um, and all of the discussion. Yeah, area. we really want to foster open discussion about this, make this easy and understandable for all students, which is, I don't, even, I don't know when the next Friday assembly is, but we plan on doing something as soon as possible with it. I think um, Piper's point is is really good. Um, I also support you know this this switch, um, but I, I do think that it's got to, it has to the transition or the the move forward has to be done carefully and uh, with buy-in from everybody. That's why I was a little concerned to hear that the survey didn't you know, ask for input or feedback. It was just like one bum bum bum. While I understand you're not trying to cater to. Um, you're trying to you're trying to cater to the need. I understand that, um, but there's also a history and a sensitivity that I think it, it will just will lay a better, more supportive ground moving forward. Um, and I, I just encourage you to to pursue that. And, and um, it sounds like you will. And then also, uh, the survey just went out this morning. I'm glad you're getting really quick responses, but I, I would like just in order to give my full blessing, I'd like to know what the results are in the end. Like, you know, how many people responded? What was the time frame that people could respond? You know, one day is, is you know, you've got great responses, but it's not a lot of time to respond. It's pretty immediate. No, I'm, I'm just saying, like, as, as far as I'm concerned, like, get, wanting to give you my blessing, like, I, there's just a couple steps I want to, I would like to see taken before I, I say go for it. Um, but I think I want to say that I, I, I support it. I just, I just think there's a couple steps to be taken before we make a, a switch. Yeah. Uh, so, general rule for bathroom. I'm, I get not, not know high school pretty well, except the, the bathroom is across the library. So 
Are you looking for a bathroom with privacy that can lock the door and go in? The, are you looking for a label on the door? What's the priority? We're looking to change, like, just as simple as is, we're taking off the gender specified label outside the bathroom that says male or female and just put inclusive or like. So the bathroom that's across the library, is that used by staff only or by students? But if, for example, a bathroom like that. So um, a multi-stall bathroom was important for us because we feared that having a single-stall bathroom could be more isolating um, for kids that went in there and, and had to use it. It could make them feel more segregated. So we're oh. using a multi-stall restroom, which is why we're doing a pair. One has urinals, one doesn't have urinals. That was also the most cost-effective considering we're about to go into a needs assessment where some large renovations will likely done, but having the multi cell was a large priority for us. Yeah. So that room across the library, the bathroom that's across the library, that is what, what do you put the label on or not? So I know that anybody can use that, including my kids who are Muslim who wants to go in that bathroom and they have to do a certain preparation for before the prayer, like wudu, and you may know that, and so they could use that bathroom as well. So it would be not specific to any particular group, it could be used by everybody. Yeah, and the bathroom across from the library on the second floor is a completely separate thing, and that would remain as is. What we're concerned with is the bathroom on the bottom floor, and that would simply be labeled all-inclusive restroom. With um, the option of the other two restrooms down the hall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would the hope be that everyone would feel comfortable using the bathroom so there would be no stigma attached yeah. to going to this particular bathroom whatsoever? Mm -hmm. So it seems like if you'd have an as assembly or some type of discussion, like Piper mentioned, where you would give the student body the why behind it, really give the why, let them understand, and then possibly have the survey, maybe just one question. Yeah. Like Hope said, would you, would you use this? If you have to go to the bathroom, would you use this bathroom, yes or no? Um, then it seems like you could have the support from everyone. I would just encourage you to first give everybody the why, yes, present we, like you're doing today, but present, that. and then and then have the question. And then when you see the support, then it seems like, oh yeah, this is like a no-brainer. Let's have this bathroom. So just so you guys know exactly why a multi-stall is so important to us and why we want to avoid the stigmatization, there are many transgender, non-binary, outside of the typical binary students in Cape Elizabeth High School and I don't think any of them are publicly out right now to a major to the school, um, and that is because they do not feel it is a safe enough environment in the school, which is a whole different issue, and that's something we're trying to help rectify through this. But there is a concern among those students that if they go into a single stall bathroom, then they will be considered that it will inadvertently out them, and it will make them feel unsafe in the school which is why the multi-stall and which is why this is so important to us and which is why we think it needs to happen now because there are real students who are told that they have, can use Ms. Beckel's office, which is fantastic that she's offered that, or the nurse's office, but those are only two single-stall restrooms and we have more than one person who identifies as something outside of the typical binary. Uh, but also, thank you so much for your advice and we'll definitely be following yeah. up on that. It's, yeah, Probably. really good for your support just as a firm that does a lot of a lot of historic educational, especially um, uh, at the university level, but um, we design non gender specific bathrooms all the time. Uh, a couple things that I want you to know is that if you're going to use a multi stall location, you uh, probably have to retrofit the stalls to be the full privacy stalls. It tends to be that when you choose a location that doesn't have that, they don't get used. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that can have some. Second is it's uh, state plumbing code is a little slow to catch up. So you will find that if uh, you try to do some things that are a little bit more aggressive, you can be in violation of state plumbing code. So just uh, you need to do your homework on state plumbing. Yeah, so we met, I think Ms. Farrell, who's the leader of the GSTA, at the town attorney just to make sure everything was solid there, as well as we had a meeting with Mr. Schwartz, who's in charge of all the facilities. And we did walkthroughs of all four bathrooms downstairs. And it's kind of determined that since we plan on doing two bathrooms, that we would make the sign say 
this bathroom has urinals and this bathroom doesn't have urinals. And so we wouldn't really have to change any of the stall requirements, but we definitely, we really looked into that and that was part of our, the reasoning between doing two instead of one was so we could make sure that we fit all the codes and that we, you know, wouldn't run into any issues with that. If we don't change any plumbing, you think we're all good? If you don't change any plumbing, Okay, cool. And then I think more of what we were saying is um, if the they don't have stalls, then um, it's not, they just probably won't be used as much, um, which makes sense. And we were looking at costs of adding in stalls and definitely keeping that open and um, maybe if the school is doing some remodeling and um, looking at the needs assessment. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to jump in just because we've got to move along oh, tonight, yeah. sadly. Um, no, no, I appreciate your time, um, but we've got a really full agenda. And what I'd like to recommend is between now and the next uh, school board meeting, if you guys can compile some of the information we're asking for, if you can take some of the steps that have been suggested. Um, and in the meantime, perhaps we can t talk to Perry and, and Seth even um, about you know what can be done legally um, in the near future rather than waiting until a, a bond is passed. Um, but if you can have as much information as possible by, um, is it March 9th, I think, the next school board meeting, which is the second Tuesday of the month. That would be great. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much for your Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this forward. Of course. Okay, so we're gonna move on to administrative reports from principals first. So we're we starting with Jason. Um, knowing that we do have a full agenda, I have asked the, the administrators to be concise. Perfect. <laughs> well, Donna, I promise. <laughs> So yes, good evening, and I will be. I've, I've selected just three quick sections from my report to share tonight. Um, first, I just want to thank the board for what is so far a very clear and systematic budget process. So I just want to thank you for that, and folks are noticing, and um, staff at Pond Cove have commented, uh, so they appreciate it, and I certainly do, so thank you. Um, second, Last week we had two amazing um, musical performances, evening performances. On Tuesday, uh, we had our fourth graders. Uh, they did an outstanding job at their evening concert. And on Thursday, um, we were wowed by our third graders. And so I'd like to thank the students. They practiced, they worked really hard. I'd like to thank uh, Rebecca Bean, our amazing music teacher, who made it all possible, and thank the parents. We always have an amazing turnout. Um, the cafetorium is just cram full every time we have a concert, so it never fails. So that's wonderful. Um, and just lastly, a little tidbit of information I wanted to share. I wanted to make the board aware of the number of prospective families that reach out to Pond Cove for tours every year. And I'm not sure if it's something that, that many of you are aware of, that it occurs so often at the elementary level, but it's not uncommon at all for parents to reach out to me for information about the school um, and request a visit and a tour. So I wanted to share a little bit about that. So um, it's often, most often it's families deciding uh, they, they know they want to move to this area and they're deciding um, whether they're moving to Cape or to a surrounding town or they're moving to Cape and they're deciding between Pond Cove and uh, a private school. And so um, last year I gave 17 of these tours and so they're so they're they're so frequent that actually to manage it this year I've come up with four tour dates and so this Friday I have three families coming in. Um, so I just wanted to mention that so you're aware that it it happens frequently. Um, and I just made notes from my past experience last year. Um, frequently asked questions. Um, 
parents ask a lot about offerings, such as, as specific literacy and math programming. They are all often very interested in world language offerings. They, they want to make sure that we have that. Uh, they also ask um, a lot of questions about technology available. They're wondering for one-to-one or two-to-one, and they ask those questions a lot. And very frequently they ask about how we support um, the social-emotional development of our students. Those are kind of like, I think, three main highlights that I hear often in terms of questions from parents. So that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Yes. Oh, oh so one quick question. <laughs> yes. Um, and Kimberly has. One I was too. brief, just um, for the record. <laughs> are you? You are. You're great. You're, thank no, you. no, no. Please. You was good. <laughs> um, I'll be. I'll be quick. Yes. Would you say the numbers have increased? In terms of tours? Well, so last year was my first year. Uh -huh. This year I have, I mean, I have the tour dates. I had a date in the fall and I had four families. I have three. But then I also should add, in between those tour dates I've given, um, I don't have an exact count. I would say I'm probably at 10 right now. Um, I often give just random tour dates because people are just flying in and they're in town for a few days. And so I don't hold them to that. If they really need uh -huh. to come in, I just schedule it. But I try to encourage them to do one of the dates. So I don't know about an increase. I think it would probably hold pretty steady. Uh, but I only have one year to go on. Yep. Kimberly, did, did you? Um, I was just wondering, that, so hearing that you know, you've know you done it last year, and um, this year, I don't know if there's data that exists, but as, as far as how many families come and look, and then how many of those families actually choose to enroll at Pond Cove, um, if we don't, I mean, I would think that's easy to get. Yes, I, I don't have the numbers. I would say very definitely most. Most people I see do do come to Pond Cove. Not all, but most, I would say, and definitely 75 plus percent. Is there ever an opportunity for families who choose against coming to Pond Cove um, to have a follow-up conversation and just their reasons why? Uh, I haven't. I haven't done that, no. But it's interesting to, to think about how to follow up with them. I, I mean, typically we either hear back from and they register or they don't. I have seen a few families. Um, I, I've seen two families that chose a different community and talked to them at that school before when I was picking up my own children, and that was kind of funny. Um, but so they don't all come, but most do. Yes? So my question is, uh you did a great job, so I'm going to be asking for, I personally looking for some homework. Uh, since you've been giving your tour, one or two, and you know that this is where we're going to get a lot of kids, I'd like to see your checklist, how you give your tour, who do you introduce, what do you show to them, if that's not too personal, guys. No, Because sure. I really like to know how you market the school. I can uh, easily do that. I yeah, I have a little routine now. Okay, so. awesome. Okay, Thank I'll you. put that together and I'll get it to you. Yeah. Okay, you. yep. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. I think I can be quicker. Um, so just really quickly, um, a couple of things I just wanted to share. One is we're in the process of planning our um, MEA testing, I, keep, I still call it MEA, but the state testing, we're trying this year to put more of an emphasis and focus on um, just on the test and making it more important for kids to kind of put forth their best effort because sometimes it just is a thing they do, they never really get the result, it seemingly has little impact on them. So I'm not sure how much effort always goes into it um, for everyone. So we are planning to be serving breakfast and working with the kitchen staff, serve breakfast for all students that day free um, and have some staff in there preparing and cooking and um, just kind of ramping it up a little bit, which has last year did not happen. Um, they kind of just came in and we took it. So really we're going to try as a staff to put more of an effort and, and focus on that to see what it does to our scores. Um, I think we will see that it's going to improve them. It would be my guess. Um, on a, we are planning our first winter carnival. I don't know the history of Cape. I know we didn't have it last year. Um, so we're having, trying to plan a winter carnival with some students' help this year on Friday. Uh, hopefully if 
staff have all signed up for the activities they're going to offer and run and, and everything has happened, there may be a spreadsheet out tomorrow for that and then we can kind of solidify it and send it home. Uh, but really the goal is to maintain a, a higher level of attendance on that day. That typically is not a, a great attendance day for us. Um, so if we, I think if we get kids some activities that they enjoy and, and um, want to be a part of, that will help that process of getting kids in school for that last day. Uh, in addition to having them leave for break at what can be a pretty tough time of year, um, on a good note, in which I think turns them into coming back on a, on a more positive note when that happens. So we're in the process of, of building that. This eighth grade group's kind of in, been working for a while on this, and I think they're looking forward to leave, starting something that will be carried on. Um, so that's that's coming. So if you have kids in the middle school, you'll probably be getting something in the email about that soon. Um, otherwise than that, we did have some um, parking lot patrol happen over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the parent drop-off loop, which every year is an issue. Um, so that was, you know, I got to thank Mr. Mori and, and Dave Galvin is just, he is so helpful as a resource officer. He's willing to come and do um, and be supportive and be seen, I think, as a support to our community as opposed to some, you know, the police role. Um, I, there's a rumor that in the pie eating contest on Friday, he's going to be representing the staff. So we'll see how he does with that. So thanks. Thanks, Tori. So I just wanted to mention a few recent events and, and run some names of students by you who performed really well in these events. Um, our Model UN team just came back from Boston University this past weekend. Eric Barber um, won best position paper for his role as Poseidon in the Gods of Olympus Crisis Committee, which was about settling World War One. So I don't... Rena Sparks, whom you just met, she was one of those students here. Uh, Rena Sparks was the outstanding delegate for her performance on the ad hoc committee, which was great. Um, then we had a recent robotics event, and there were two teams. We have all five of our high school teams are qualified for VEX states competitions, which is great. Uh, but the recent events, two teams won, were among the best teams, um, winning the Excellence Award, the Tournament Champion Award, and the Skills Award were a team of Lauren Abrahamson, Ethan Coronite, Carmen Erickson, Evan Gebhardt, and Carter Merriam. And then the second team, who were also tournament champions, I think they must be like a different division or something, um, Carter Abrahamson, Sarah Hagen, Eva Morris, and Matthew Zimmerman. So congratulations to all of those. And then we have a number of students who won gold, who are gold key winners in the Scholastic Writing Awards, which are a national competition. And the gold key awards are the highest level of recognition that students can get. Um, so Sylvia Brock, Lauren Cutter, McKenna Devereaux, Rohan Friedman, Catherine Raup, and again, Raina Sparks. So I just wanted to mention all of those Cape Elizabeth High School students for those wonderful accomplishments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, evening. I'll be very concise. Um, as far as news in the special education realm, um, I attended last week, I attended the Cumberland County MADSAC meeting. Uh, much of the time was spent discussing uh, the many bills that are uh, before, at, uh, at the, that have been, are being considered at the state level. Um, as far as one of those being the one that I had mentioned to you folks before about the preschool piece and that uh, has not made any movement. Um, in early March, uh, we have two special education teachers, uh, Melissa Baum and Tom Robinson, who will be attending the Spire Reading Training in Augusta. This is a MADSEC sponsored training. And currently we are servicing 161 students in special ed. And we have 21, in re 21 students in referral and two that are outplaced. Thank you. Thank you. We are just rolling along. Um, 
So it being the middle of the year, I've prepared a mid-year update for you. It is in your packet. It's, I think, right behind the main benefits trust information. And if you've had a chance to look at it, you'll see that what I've done is to divide the work um, by district and the three schools. It focuses on evaluation, federal state oversight, curriculum alignment, professional development, and intervention. And it's just my way of letting you know what work has been completed in those areas, what's ongoing, um, what we hope to complete by the end of the year, and what we have put into the column called next year with uh, S in parentheses, just in case it takes a little bit longer than one more year. And uh, this has been um, posted on the website, and I just I invite any of you, after you've had a chance to review it, to get in touch with me. Anybody who is watching this or happens to see it on the website, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to talk about where we've been and where we're going and, uh, and why. And thank I can take so questions now, but oh. Thank you so much, Kathy. This is great. Oh, oh you're yeah. welcome. Again, I look forward to hearing from folks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I like the color coding, too. <laughs> color coding always helps. <laughs> so um, our finances are, we are in good shape. We're seven months through the, school, uh, the fiscal year. Um, and if you take a percentage based on that, we'd be at 58.33%. But if you look at the report, we're actually at 57.55%. So we're in good shape. And we're, Don and I are reviewing it every month and keeping a um, tab on all of our expenditures. And I also wanted to point out that we have added a little bit more information to the financial sheet. The, very, what, the second to last page is showing the nutrition funds so you can see how, how much we spend in our food service program outside of the general budget. So there, I just want to let you know about those changes. Any questions? Okay, okay. good. Thanks, Thanks Catherine. You. So you have a, um, an enrollment sheet in your packet that's about right behind the financials. Um, we're up a few students from last month, but down... Um, 16 students from last February. Um, we have been working on the Teacher Evaluation Steering Committee. That committee is up and running um, again this year, and we have been revising procedures now that we're really um, into using the system, um, and also revising forms, and we've had forms that have been run by the, um, the administrative team and then go to the steering committee for approval. So I think that's um, been a fairly good system that we have going here. Here. Um, and administrators have been using part of a team meeting for training um, each time we meet. So uh, training in the system right now, we have been looking at um, samples of the administrators' um, observation and feedback to the teachers. Plans for the future search, search event on Friday evening, March 15th, and Saturday, March 16th um, continue to progress. We have our list of participants almost complete, and uh, we'll be sending out confirmation letters probably uh, late next week. And then an open invitation will go out to community members um, probably the last week in February. Um, today, the A team worked on a guiding question for the event. And uh, what we came up with was how should education in Cape Elizabeth look in order to be responsive to the current and future needs of our students? So, as long as that is okay with the board, I think we'll, we'll go with that as a focusing question um, for the day. Um, I continue to attend monthly meetings with the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, and we have been doing some work on sharing professional development opportunities and food purchasing. And recently, the group received a pretty large grant to fund a leadership academy, which will be up and running um, next year. And it will be uh, our staff, as, as well as the other staff uh, in the Alliance, will have an opportunity to attend. And we just got a new member, RSU 5, which is Freeport and Pamela, just joined the group. So that 
that's good news. And I just want to do a shout out to um, Peter Esposito and uh, Jeff Shedd and Nate Carpenter, who did a wonderful pasta bar last week. And uh, the kids loved it. Um, a couple, Kathy and I went over. Um, and it was, it, was, it was great. It was great fun. And the kids just were having a wonderful time watching them do the cooking. So they wore big chef's hats and aprons. And it was, it was great. So. Who did the cleaning? Uh, I don't know who did the cleaning. <laughs> Probably the food service staff, I imagine. It was great. Okay, all right. So moving on to new business, we um, are lucky to have um, James Hebert and Seth, Seth Wildschutz, Wildschutz. Wildschutz, sorry, um, with us to just provide a bit more uh, detail on the proposal um, before us for a needs assessment study. Thanks for coming, especially tonight. And, uh, we'll take the next two hours. To go to <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so based on the, uh, the the grave feedback that we have, uh, there were some questions from, based on what's inside the proposal that we have for you folks. Uh, going through the introductions, I'm James and Seth. Um, so the needs assessment scope is broken down in these categories. We have our field investigations, scoping of potential projects uh, and upgrades for each of the schools, stakeholder interviews with te stakeholder interviews with teachers, staff, and students. Uh, and our proposal listed out as four meetings, uh, project team meetings. Those are four uh, building committee meetings, five meetings, public presentations, and then the full uh, report of the needs assessment itself. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just break down each of these really quickly. Uh, well, obviously not quickly, but uh, if anyone has any questions, please jump in. So field investigations, um, this team's going to survey all the existing conditions in the school. Um, obviously during off hours of the facility, we've been doing this in the summertime, document current status of all the existing building systems. And it's not, uh, this is the point where we uh, look above every ceiling tile and we go into every single classroom and all of the, all, every corner of each school. Uh, and it goes beyond just pointing out what's broken or what needs to be replaced. Um, this is the point where we, we really go into space planning and classroom needs and security access and just looking beyond the things of the thermostat's broken, it's cold in here, let's fix it. Um, there are a lot more, a uh, lot more, there's a lot more to it here. Uh, compiled, uh, the, the compiled data of what we would get from this field investigation during the summertime is really the backbone and the foundation of the needs assessment report. This is all of the data. Um, in addition to this, uh, we ha still have the data that we took last year when we were brought on 2017 uh, and all the efforts gone through there. We still have all of that, which will also be incorporated into here as well. Um, I'm going to skip this next slide and come right back to it in a moment. Uh, so the scoping of projects piece, uh, based on information uh, gathered from the field investigations, each project is documented on a data sheet to clarify the scope of work. Uh, each project categorized critical, intermediate, and low priority. And then one question is, you know, who establishes this prioritization? Well, at the very top, it's security and life safety, uh, ADA, and Title IX requirements. Uh, and then also defining the priority of projects we would list as critical, intermediate, or low priority. The stakeholder interviews, meeting with the staff, the students, the faculty, uh, project team meetings, uh, building committee meetings, um, and then recommendations to be gathered from all the groups involved here. Um, and the actual data sheet that we provide is this, uh, this is just an example a sample here. So we would have, say for instance, the generator, um, a potential generator at the Pond Cove and Middle School. We would have an existing conditions describing the need uh, and the, the, the lack of a generator at the school recommendations section, which would be this is what we're going to provide um, and why we're going to provide it in the location that we're proposing. Uh, then we're offering a next level sort of description off of each one of these projects. And this is sort of where the, the, the fun part Part happens where you know utilizing something like a building a digital building management system and smart technology you know you could have a message sent to Perry on the weekend 
that says, hey, the gen we lost power, the generator's functioning, you might want to go check out what's happening at the school. And a building management system goes beyond just connecting a generator to your phone or sending you an email. It connects to everything in your school. It'll send you a trouble notification that will say that, well, you know, you're running low on oil in one of these, uh, one of your facilities here, or your fire alarm's going off, or there's a trouble alarm somewhere. And those uh, information like that can be sent right to the palm of your hand in, in the form of an email or a text. And so instead of, uh, instead of going home on Friday, something happens and you wait until Monday and hopefully it wasn't too bad, you can have something like, you can have a building management system that can tie everything all together and really give you more ease of access to it, as well as streamline maintenance as well. Um, Perry can focus and the facility staff can focus their efforts on you know, the critical path items that are being addressed that, that have issues at the current time. Um, and then underneath, at the very bottom, we would just provide a really basic scope of work. Uh, now, this is the kind of the scope of work section is something that uh, is put out with an RFP or RFQ by the town that says, "Hey, we need help installing a generator." The scope of work here would just sort of give you a general idea of contractor needs to provide a 200 kW generator with a 12 by 18 concrete utility pad. They need to interconnect that with a service rated automatic transfer switch. And engineering garble, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that would be the technical information but that um, the school or the facilities group would take and they'd be able to form that into something for a contractor to help work on. If in the event of an emergency happened, it's like, I need somebody now uh, to work on this. This is what this data sheet is uh, meant to help describe. Uh, so talking about the stakeholder interviews, the four of them. So the, these are, this is the point, where, again, a, a lot more of the fun, you know, the, our team will meet with the students, the staff, the teachers from each of the three, three schools, um, discuss current facility challenges, desired improvements, and, you know, questions like what would your ideal question, what would your ideal classroom look like? Um, something that we took away uh, from the tours that we did earlier this year, or last year rather, um, was uh, one of the folks who came across on the tours asked the question, if you had a perfect situation, what would this look like? And we try to capture all that information and bring it all together and then prioritize that and what can we do, what can't we do? Uh, and this is all just, again, data, information gathering. Um, so the team would document all the responses, summarize it into meeting minutes that are, will obviously be publicly accessible. Um, and the compiled data will be included in the need assessment report saying that, We've heard what you were saying, and these are how we're going to address these items. Now, in, uh, with regard to the stakeholder interviews, there was one um, long comment that came up that said because of the, the way the budget would be approved, um, students and faculty would be out of out of session for this year. We would have to wait until September or October. Um, if it were the desire of the school board to act sooner, if there's any uh, flexibility in, in this year's budget, we could we could try to have those earlier in late April or May. While the people are still here, you still have uh, faculty who have just experienced the midwinter. Um, you have people who are, are, are into the swing of things as far as the school year is concerned, whereas sometimes in September, October, they're fresh coming off of summer vacation. You may have some new faculty and staff that haven't experienced a main winter here yet. Um, so if we could try to have these uh, stakeholder interviews take place in April or May, um, I think that would be a, that would be a great, uh, great advantage for us, that we would have that information going forward into the summertime. Um, the project team meetings, um, we've, we've uh, com um, provided four of these, com uh, comprised of the following team members, so someone from the superintendent's office, someone from town hall, someone from school board, someone from town council, someone from finance and facilities department, um, and obviously Colby Co-Engineering and Scott Simons Architects. Uh, this would be a, a much smaller group. Um, the purpose would just be provide uh, you know, regular updates and project progress, uh, really get into a lot of the nitty gritty details of here's what we're doing this week, here's what we're doing this week. Um, and a lot of direction would, uh, would come from this, this small group, this project team. Now, going forward to that, I mentioned the building committee meetings. So these building committee meetings, it would be similar in size um, 
to the previously completed uh, NAGES assessment committee that we did late last year. So again, someone from the superintendent's office, town hall, school board members, uh, town council members, school volunteers, students, uh, anyone from the public who wants to attend. That would be sort of a larger setting to again, uh, gather more inf gather, gather more data, gather more input, like talk and get folks to express, you know, here are the needs that we see that we need to address. And again, that's more data for us to compile into this uh, needs assessment report. Um, and again, with the project team and the building committee, these are what will establish the prioritization of critical, intermediate, and low priority projects. Because what we'll do is we'll list everything out and say, well, these are all code required. You kind of have to do these, and then based on based on going through those items, we would add in more and say, you know, what what is the will of everyone here that wants to focus on? Like, what what are we going to be going? Um, and then lastly, public presentations for these. You know, we can, it, we've just said four public presentations. It can be to all to the school board, a mix between school board and town council. I know last year there was a joint school board and town council meeting that took place. And again, the purpose is just to keep everything transparent and uh, provide overall project updates and take more comments from the public and people who are there. Again, uh, there's, there's, there's nothing to hide. We're here to, to answer questions and collect data and provide you the product that you want. Um, and lastly, uh, I'll, I'll throw in my favorite okay. slide, as well as Kaylin's favorite slide. Um, you know, you, you folks, just seeing what, uh, just seeing what happened here tonight with all the principals talking about the students and the students who are coming up here and speaking and, you know, a lot of very brave things to do. You have a lot to be proud of here. And, uh, and really the, and seeing what happened. And the goal of this report is really just to, to arm your staff with the information they need to keep your buildings going. And uh, keep, every, keep everything, as Kaylin said, um, keep everything along that maintenance line so you sort of carry your buildings to the end of their life. And um, we'll, we'll obviously provide all the analysis in this report to give you uh, what you need to upgrade your buildings and, and provide all the options. I guess, uh, is there anything you want to add tonight? No. Any questions? Thank you. This was Thank you. exactly what we were hoping for. The cool. presentation is perfect. Wonderful. Thanks. Very clear. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, what we can do is uh, I'll send an email to you folks tomorrow morning and give you a copy of this so you can disperse this however Great. you'd like. That would be fantastic. Great. Uh, yeah. Because I think, can I ask me? Ah. I, th I think there's been a lot of questions of what does this needs assessment entail and, and, sure. and, and what do we get with that? And I think this answers a lot of those questions. So the, the intent is you would get a lot of these, right? The dash. The book. Right. So some are very specific. And I appreciate the example. Engineering focused uh, items, some are harder to define or, or very definable as a, as a like the uh, new camp gear, right? It's, it's, it's a little harder to say kind of what it will look like on the sheets, right. but we can go into a lot of the reasons and try to give you the idea would be that you can take that you take a select version of these and pull apart your projects and either set aside uh, individual year funds. For ten of them, whatever they total up, mm -hmm. or you need to go out for a fund uh, if, if you wanted to tackle some of the bigger ones. Does this include any site plans or any? Will this give us the give us lead us in the direction of better preparation for the barns as well? Anything of that nature? Uh, it does not include detailed design work. So we'll okay. That is to keep the cost down. Yeah. Um, the idea here would be that these could then be given to the main team, whether it's us or somebody else, to say, these are the 10 things that you designed. Go. 10 or 20, I don't know what the Okay. These are the things that, that the school board and town council decided they're going to work on either this year with maintenance funds or maybe it's a bond, right? And now we need to go out for this will not give you uh, construction document design documents. Okay. Uh, that's, that's been specifically excluded. Uh, so it will be enough information to then go to the next step. This type of scope that you guys have, I mean, you guys chose the easy one as a generator. How do you guys categorize your workload? 
Well, if it's going to be roofing, is it going to be all roofing, or is it going to be middle school roofing, or is it going to be a particular square footage on the Pacific area, or if it's going to be lighting, or is it going to be, if it's going to be leaking? How do you guys categorize your work? Yeah, so I'll take, I'll take the roof example. Um, there may be parts of the roof that are completely fine, and I know that the, there was some roof work done in the schools here not too long ago, but there may be a small area where there is a leak that needs to be patched, and that would be something that would be documented here. As Seth said, you know, it's hard to, it, would, it will be hard to, uh, to, uh, in, to, to capture you know, the large scale renovations of these. Those will be described in the report. Um, oh, these, these data sheets here is just meant for, um, you know, these are some, uh, I'll say, easier targets for a, little, a lack of a better term. Okay. That Perry can then take and he can group four or five, six of these together, go out for pricing. And it'll give a much more clear direction to get pricing and more accurate pricing as well. Rather than just say, um, they go to a contract that says, buy me a generator, install it at the school. Okay. Well, the, the contractor doesn't really have anything to go on. What's existing there? What kind of pad they're going to have? Where is it going to be located? What do I have to do to make sure everything's interconnected correctly? Where the point of this is to give them that much more direction and say, you will put a generator in this section here. It's going to be connected to this transformer and your main switch here inside your building. You're going to provide a service rate automatic transfer switch. And it'll give that technical inf enough technical information um, that they will be a place to start. Uh, yes. Uh, there won't always be enough information on these sheets. Some of the easy ones, we can probably just go to our contractor and say, here it is, give me this. A lot of them are going to require more sophisticated engineering to actually design the, the end goal. Uh, and so you know, then you have to go to an architect and engineering team, um, us for one of our counterparts. So the idea would be that each of these will have uh, uh, a section at the end that would be associated with pricing information. So he's got this tag, it's hard to see this tag, D01, because it's electrical. And so we have, it would be grouped by school and by priority, and then all of them will be tagged with kind of a, an estimated low, mid, and high dollar amount for that item. Uh, some of them are going to be really relatively easy to estimate, some are going to be really Parameters of what you're estimating, so it'll be dollars per square foot kind of estimates. But still, something you can do with the ballpark, you know, a generator of this size will cost X to X in 20, you know, 2019. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in the details of when things are happening and how much it's going to cost and all that stuff, but I thought I heard you mention, which sounded very wise, that uh, it w it's beneficial to get the input from the teachers and the staff and the students in April or May after they've been through a winter here, as opposed to September when they've been gone for summer or there's new staff members who haven't participated in a main winter. And I thought I heard you say if the school board has money to pay for that, um, and I'm just a little confused on how that's going to happen because we won't even be able to budget for this until. Do you know where I'm going, Elizabeth? I do. To I'm this. So I had like it's a question and an idea, and it's all sort of together and kind of piggyback. Because we won't have our right. budget passed until so after that time point. I think where where we could go with that thought. Mm -hmm. Um, it would really depend on, you know, having an understanding so we can go as far as has, has the town council approved our budget to go out to the voters. And at that point, that's, that's really as far as we can get before almost the end of the school year. And so at that point, I, I believe you would have to take the gamble. Right. Because we have, at, at that point, it goes out to the voters in June. So... <laughs> that's, a, that's a discussion, I think, to have among yourselves, as in, are we willing to take the gamble that the, the school budget passes because this, you know, these conversations are a part of the needs assessment that <clears throat> will likely be included in the budget. Mm -hmm. um, we can't say until we vote. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. I, I think it's, it's really more up to... The, the, it's a little bit tricky. Yeah. Uh, you think, uh, There's that. 
partners at our respective firms. But right. um, yeah, we're in progress in this process, and we're hoping to working with you to figure out how to make it work. And so I guess that initial payment that we gave you in 2017 is well so gone. More completed than the yeah. So there's none of that left over to pull from. This is now starting fresh. I figured. I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> I, I do have one, one more question, and I feel like, Kimberly, you, you wanted clarification on this and um, earlier, maybe in the last needs assessment built, uh, meeting, but so in terms of timing, assuming um, it's included in the budget and assuming it passes um, in, by the referendum, uh, and assuming you're able to have the stakeholder meetings before summer, um, is it possible, I mean, I know we talked about this before, but would, would we, after all your work included in the needs assessment, would we be poised to um, ask a go for a bond in November? I think that's the deadline, I think that Matt said last time. Or is that just not possible with this process? How quickly was the Okay. okay, so what, I guess what I'm trying to get at, do you remember this question, Kimberly, um, was you know, uh, given what will be accomplished in the needs assessment, let's say time was worked just perfectly, would we be poised to, to let's say November, let's say it was possible time-wise to November go to bond, would you have enough information in this process to say this, this is the figure without, without the drawings? Okay, so I think what you I think what the needs assessment will give the town and the school board and the community is a very comprehensive list of recommended projects. The recommendations will come from what really needs to be done on the code of the safety and security threat, but also what the group is recommending on how to write the Someone, and that's not us. Or a group of people, like Donna and the school board, will have to probably pick, and probably will not be able to take all of them. Mm -hmm. So there will be probably need to be time after you get the report, you know, there will be a lot of time to agree here, for a committee to figure out, well, what are we really going to do next? Right? And to do the report and that next step, I think it is probably the idea um, the idea is that we want to make sure that we have enough time for all the stakeholder meetings project meetings building committee meetings um, and that was that was certainly spread out throughout the entire summer so as Seth said, as Seth said um, it would be difficult to try to narrow down exactly what to pursue. Uh, that would have to be that separate discussion of what do we pull from this that we want to go for uh, and possibly be the following year, the following June. Okay. Oh, we don't want to rush it. So, we want to do it right. Did, no, I, I was just wondering, I think to Kimberly's point um, was, uh, Gosh, maybe what would happen if we put the money back in from what we were contemplating last year? Would we be any further ahead come November? Well, yes, because of what we, what we, a lot of what we took out That's a design. Right, was design work so that we could better hone in what does, for example, the cafeteria. How much money we spend on a cafeteria could vary. You know, we could do it, I don't want to do it. We can do it for one dollar, we can do ten dollars, right? Um, and really, we have to really kind of narrow it. How big is it? How much uh, kitchen equipment can we reuse? How long is the existing cafeteria down? Do we need temporary facilities? Right. A lot of the decision making has to go into even come up with a really great number of some early design work, where it's plumbing, um, and so uh, without doing a lot of that, it's, it's harder for us to give you a real. Great number, yeah. you know, 
in the past, and you know, the cap carry already done the work, so that that is not a great tool. We have yeah. But uh, I'm sure there'll be something else where we won't have great information, we won't have done a design, yeah. and so it'll be, you know, in a partial size for whatever the thing is, and a dollar per square foot. Mm -hmm. And that is enough to kind of get a real ballpark, but um, not much more. Not enough to go out for a bond. Not specific enough, in your opinion. Well, it might depend on what it is. Yeah. Just um, you're, we're getting rid of the yeah. spot because the um, if someone identifies a series of projects, or a group of people identify a series of projects, and you say, you come to us and say, these are things we want to do, and, and we have your list, right? And we can do the design work before you about the bond and take it to a certain level. We have a really good idea of the cost, but you have to have money to pay for that additional design work, at least up to a point. Right? So if we don't do all that, then you kind of are this catch-22 where the bond that needs to include the money for all that additional design work, plus all the stuff that we the full design has to be also included in the bond, yeah. right? and other soft costs. And so the soft costs can vary dramatically depending on what the work is. So the cost of soft cost for the kitchen uh, you know, could be pretty high. Uh, kitchen equipment is pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So so I, I guess the thing that I, I just need clarity on, so how, how we're moving, or you know, what we have in front of us here. Would there then be, we would either have to figure out kind of a rough idea how to roll it into a bond or come up with money beyond the needs assessment to pay for the design work to get a concrete figure of what we need of to this, of the items you want to move forward, move so forward to with and what the design item you want to do the design work and items that work moving forward in that first phase, whatever that first phase is. Right. So if you said these are the fifteen items we want to move forward, then the design work is a strong go to yes, that's part of the catch two there's be funds to pay for that. So that's one of the things right. that, that higher Older dollar figure did was to front load some of that design paper. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it does put you in a tough position, but I don't have a good way. Right. I know. I guess, I mean, I just I keep coming back to sort of the security stuff in particular that um, I, I think there's, you know, for sure a feeling of urgency in the community around that. And um, and I think a, a decent amount of consensus that that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, so I just, I hate to see us, you know, in a position where we're aware and not able to act for, you know, even a further period of time, so, I don't know. Um, I have a question. Actually, you say that there is design work already for the cafeterias. Is that well, correct? there's a preliminary design work that was done as part of the... Right, as part of the initial payments. Yes. Is it, this is just thinking a little bit outside the box and not all or nothing, but being what you just said, we have the cafeteria preliminary design. Is it possible, I'm almost scared to say this, but to adjust the number of the needs assessment proposal and add just one design mm -hmm. of the safety and the entryways and say, look, we're willing to throw in, I mean, if you can give us a ballpark figure of how much you think that would cost to add that design, since that does seem like a unanimous thing. And so it's not, the whole scope of design work, but just yes. a portion of it? Yes. Yes. And we can definitely, I don't, don't want to give a number right now, but we can definitely give We can compile that and get back to you on that. Is that something that I was thinking the same, same exact thing. Might be. And if there are other, I obviously want to get the number low so the process is bolder, but uh, if there are other specific things that people think should be better from you know, that same schematic level of design effort, is this not uh, what we discussed at the last needs assessment in terms of weighing the pros and cons? Elizabeth, did you want to answer? No, I've just been waiting to speak for a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to get back to was I feel like although um, it is a little bit described as being in a catch-22, um, I think that it can be premature to ask for design before 
the group has identified the list of projects because it seems like putting the cart before the horse. And so while I agree that there is urgency and consensus around safety concerns, I think that when we start trying to choose which safety concerns are the priority, we're gonna get into trouble. Because as there was discussion at that um, last needs assessment committee, what we think of as the priority, which are the entryways, there were other people who thought other things were priorities, which were um, kind of back towards the band room where the deliveries are made. And so where I think the list could get. Yeah, that's fair. So I'm, I feel a concern around <clears throat> what we consider a safe, you know, a priority and what the whole needs assessment committee con considered a priority, I, I think that's a concern. I want to say I appreciate that reminder of that conversation. I think that's an important one to keep um, on the forefront of this conversation is that we don't know what we're getting into, so picking and choosing may not be the wisest. Yeah. Laura? Well, maybe not choosing ahead of time, but reserving some funds for design work based on the priority of the safety concerns. So, you know, they come up with the safety, here's the recommendations, and the ones with the highest priority, if we reserve some money in this whole needs assessment package to have some design work, then move forward. That's a, that would be a, a way to address those concerns. We so could that it add could, an allowance some dollar amount for some design work that's to be determined. Right. That occurs after the assessment's done, and but then if the money's been approved, the money's the money's there. For what that would make more sense priority. to me. So you, yeah. you don't identify which projects, but you've got some money reserved at the end to do some design work for some set of projects. What we do later. Done. Um, I would see that as a separate entry in the into the budget, adding another piece of money. Um, in addition to the needs assessment, um, I, I feel like the committee did a lot of work and they made the recommendation, yeah. and I think we need to. Time. I feel like we need to honor that. Mm -hmm. I think I agree with Elizabeth. Okay. I also, I guess I don't. So, I, I think we might still have a similar issue of so we would have the design work for that piece, and we could go and get accurate um, estimates for what it would cost to address that issue, but if we're trying to put an entire bond, you know, a collective bond forward to accomplish everything, we may not be any further ahead. We'd still need design work for yeah, what, whatever so other priorities. So bond would likely have to include, it's going to have to include soft costs anyway. So, right. uh, you know, good rule of thumb, this doesn't apply to all types of projects, but good rule of thumb is whatever the cost of the construction is, we need roughly 20% of that in additional money. And that's to pay the architects of the New Year's. You also have owner costs, so it might be temporary relocation. There are owner of the use permits are, are directly billed to the owner, so is some geological testing sometimes. And so there are a lot of other fees that you need on top of the straight construction cost. Right? And so you would, we would work with you to identify what is the construction cost, what's a reasonable soft cost for everything we need to carry on top of that, and then that's what the bond is targeting. Including escalation or whatever point we're talking about. So, and then you were talking about that. But yes, it does put everything into the, it just pushes things out a little bit. Yeah. And for some folks, escalation is the term where you have a cost now, but you're predicting what that cost is going to be two years, three years from now. No, sir? Yeah, uh, earlier, Seth, you made a comment that Donna and group or people are going to make a decision using the, the scope which project to identify as priority. And as you know, if you can go back to that, there's one big information missing, and hopefully you can add that information without adding more money to the, to the budget, uh, is the cost. So what the, for that particular one's easy is probably cost of generator and plus installation of it. But we would like to see on the scope a cost associated yeah, with all of that. Off of this, of this sheet that we compiled at the end for a couple of reasons. Um, so if you so could, it's really hard for us to give you accurate costs. You, you could give it an estimate. I mean, you're a professional. You know what so, the plumber rate is. You know what the roofing guy rate is. And, well, and, we know what individual items cost. The trick is when you, when you compile those into a project, right? 
you're going to get general conditions costs from the contractor, you're going to get temporary costs from the location costs, you're going to get a lot of soft costs that come with moving products into a construction project for a contractor. And so us putting our costs on the sheet is a little bit dangerous because one because of escalation, because someone is up the report in three years and sees that this whatever it is costs ten dollars. And construction last year was 15 to 20 percent over the prior year, right? Just in one year. Right? And so we have to really make sure that the cost is limited to just the, the work. It's very clear that it is uh, 2019 dollars. And if we group them at the end, we can work with the committee to identify realistic assumptions for soft costs. Um, I think that's the better way to do it than just to have a cost on each individual creation. But, that, but to say that there will be cost of creation uh, as part of the work. And that helps. OK. Any number helps. Hope. I just wanted to add. Um, a comment because there's sort of a few comments about the security being sort of our priority, our priority. And I, I just wanted to make a note sort of for the record that I don't think we've ever had a, had sort of a deliberation about each project and what's a priority. It's sort of been thrown out there saying this is the most important thing, this is the most important thing. But ultimately, I think there are other opinions out there. And if, if I were to say take the, the cafeteria project, and compare it to the security issues and say, if, if, we, if, they were, if they had the same cost, which one would I choose? And I'd choose the cafeteria in a heartbeat because it's affecting our children today and tomorrow and every day, every day of the year 100, with 100% certainty. So I feel like that's like sort of our, our most critical pain point. And it's, I, I, I feel like we sort of get lost in this notion of security is security. This is, this is, this is our biggest issue and it's the most important priority. But and I know that I don't want to be the, it's, it's, you know, it's not a popular opinion to say we shouldn't be worrying about that, but we're losing sight of the fact that we're, we're here to make sure that the, the learning environment is the best that it can be. And I think the most um, uh, sort of certain um, impact that we would have would be improving what's happening in the cafeteria. So. I think this is why it, it's so important um, in the future is to, as a committee, as a building committee, to work together to prioritize. Mm -hmm. and because you're right, everybody's going to, and not everybody's going to agree on what's number one, number two, number three. So, and that's what would happen with this process. We would identify a list of issues. Yeah. We would take that the project team would say, here's what we have. That goes to the building committee. That comes to a consensus, and then that's given in a public presentation. Yeah. So last question or comment. So we asked you earlier about categories. I jot down an idea and you can take it. It's repair, replace, and remodel. So if you can do it by that, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both so much for coming out tonight. This is really helpful um, and we would love to get a copy of you know, this t tonight. No, I'll, uh, send it, I'll send it over in the morning. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Thank you, great. Thank you all. Appreciate um, your time. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I think before we go on to making a motion, um, I am, uh, had reached out to several committee members and to come and just sort of give a, their synopsis of the process of the Needs Assessment Committee. Jamie, it was the kindest and most available to come tonight <laughs> after. So thank you for showing up. Thank you for the invitation and good to see all of you. Um, I'm really just here to find out if there's going to be school tomorrow so I can report back <laughs> okay. to my kids. <laughs> um, uh, after having just listened to that, um, uh, I think uh, what I'd like to say on behalf of the committee um, is that number one, I think uh, we went through a very good and thorough process. Uh, the process included a wide range and diverse um, set of uh, stakeholders and citizens throughout the community, which I thought was really important, and uh, really shined a light on um, you know some of the some of the critical needs uh, that exist in the facilities. Um, what I'm most encouraged to hear about, um, again, you know, as a as a representative of the committee, is. 
what I just heard from the uh, architectural engineering professionals about what the output will be from this next step. So I think all along we've all been wondering, okay, if this is the investment that we're going to make for them to do a certain level of preliminary work, what is that output going to be? And uh, the fact that um, we will have sort of a list of issues, opportunities, and things like that. And as Susanna, you were just saying, at that point, then be able to really roll up our sleeves and do the hard work of, okay, how do we want to handle all these things now that we know what they are? We've, we've all assumed what they are in sort of broad strokes and, and, and bigger concepts, but specifically, what are they and what needs to be tackled? And how to go about doing that and in what order um, and in, with what funding mechanism? Um, the one other point I wanted to make, um, Catherine and I were talking in the back. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I know that there's a desire to move as fast as we can. There's ev everybody always wants to move as fast as we can, and I get that. Um, I think there's also prudence in being more deliberate about things sometimes. Um, in particular, though, I wouldn't be so focused on the specific November and June elections as it relates to, um, you know, sending something out for a referendum vote on a bond. Um, would Catherine was referring to was the main bond uh, bank. That's one option for funding. There, there's private bond markets as well um, that we have used before um, and could go to again. So um, we don't need to be under artificial constraints of time and, and deadlines with things. Um, it's not inconceivable to schedule a special election for something if we have to. We don't do it regularly, um, but if you know if it, if it was something that. You know, for specific reasons of timing um, needed to be done. That's certainly something that could be looked at. So, anyway, I just want, as, as you consider this, and as, as you know, all the stakeholders move together um, on the path forward. I think that that's just something to keep in mind as well. So, anyway, it was a pleasure to be part of the process. Um, both myself and Councilor Devereaux um, appreciated uh, the opportunity to be included. And like I said, I thought um, it was a well-run process, and um, I'm looking forward to continued work and discussion on it. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Jamie. And I, I'm just going to add, just for the sake of um, those at home, and I'm going to try to do this uh, quickly, that um, all we had four <coughs> meetings. Um, there were a, a, a total of over, I don't know, I think 45 different stakeholders coming and going within the committee. Included in that were teachers and, and students. Um, and we held four meetings. Every meeting is now on the website under needs or needs assessment tab, which is at the top of the, the main homepage. Um, and included in that tab are the minutes and video tours of um, the three of the three tours we held. The first one being at um, the the high school athletic facilities, and then moving on to Palm Cove and Middle School. Um, various locations there, and then the last one being going back to the high school, looking at classrooms and the entrances and other various uh, needs. So I would encourage the public to um, go and lo look at these videos, read the minutes, and um, I just want to say that uh, Thank you to the committee for all their hard work and, and time, and then just for the clarification of um, the folks out there. The committee did vote um, unanimously to um, uh, recommend to the school board um, that we include the, the proposal of 189, um, 189, what's the exact number? Sorry. 189. 60 to um, the FY20 school budget. So with that, um, uh, would someone make a motion, please? I move we include $189,060 in the 2019-2020 budget for a needs assessment. A second. Any discussion? Thank you again to Colby and um, Simon. <laughs> also, I'm trying to place it. Sorry. Everybody, for the, all the work and time, um, I think you know this process has been good. I thank you, Jamie, for your comment on um, that. You know, being uh, approaching all of this with um, patience and um, carefulness in the end will pay off the most. Um, so, all in favor? Yeah. So, all those in favor? Thank you. All right. No, sorry. 
Uh, okay, so hmm. moving on to um, new business. We Yeah. So um, we're just notifying the public that we have received uh, retirement notices from Mark Pendarvis, Tom Lazat, and Lisa German. We will will be hard shoes to fill. Moving on to item number nine. May I have a motion, please? I consider, I consider, I move, we adopt the Cape Elizabeth 2019-2020 school year calendar. Can I have a second? Can I have a second? I second. Okay. Any discussion? No? All those in favor? Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I just wanted to ask um, if there could be a little um, discussion from the people that represented us on the committee to tell us how we got to this. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so we had a relatively easy process, I would say, in the end, because we were quite limited to paths. Um, our biggest, one of the biggest concerns was the conferences in October, uh, and we tended, we've tended in the past to do them on the 24th and the 25th, the Thursday and Friday, that last week of October before um, Halloween, uh, and for a little while there, we thought we weren't going to be able to do that date, and it was either going to have to be two weeks earlier or two weeks after, which didn't seem ideal for anybody, either too soon or too late. Uh, but in the end, we were able to take that. Uh, we maintained um, pretty much consistency with the um, early release and professional development. We got some feedback that we would appreciate more relevant, am I correct on this, Kathy? Um, better use of the time, maybe? Do you remember the exact discussion? I'm trying to remember. But there was concern about can we have conversation about it? Yeah, yeah. I think about whether that was the best model going forward. Or that was the best model. Year, yes. Right, and we just we explained that it was too soon, it was too late in the process to do that this year, and that we would check out that out for the following year. Um, we also had lots of discussions about election day on November fifth, and really just came around to the fact that the town has asked us uh, not to hold school that day, and we tried to come up with other creative ways about where to have the elections, even if it's and we just can't seem to figure it out in the limited space that this town has. Um, so we talked about, um, and please step in if I'm forgetting because I don't have my notes right here with me exactly, but August and September with the professional, um, the teacher staff days uh, as opposed to being later in the week, they wanted it on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and then have a few days off for the long weekend as opposed to um, going later in the week. So that was to accommodate the teacher's needs. It really has little effect on the students. They're still going to return to school after Labor Day. Um, and I believe that is pretty much the sum of things. We had the discussion about conferences happening in the evening, but there still is a lot of concern for high school teachers that that needs to happen during the day and that there does need to be a day, a no soon day for conferences for those October dates because of the way conferences are done for the high school. Um, and I think that's all I remember having the discussion. Like I said, it was pretty seamless, pretty, uh, a few interesting discussions, but very little changes from the way this year is working. A question? Mm. Uh, more for uh, Elizabeth, since you are on technology committee. If you guys can figure out how to push this calendar or people can accept this calendar for the calendar year on their apps or their devices, there must be a way. We can try. Thank you. Thank you to the committee for working on a calendar once again. Um, and thank you for having it ready by now. <laughs> thank you. All right, all those in favor?
Okay, moving on to item 10. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the Cape Elizabeth High School Program of Studies for 2018-2019. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Is there any change from the um, the early run that, that you gave us, Mr. Shedd? Is it as, okay, as we saw it? Um, I just want to say uh, again um, that I'm really encouraged by the shift in um, the weights of um, AP and honors and CP. I think um, as I understand it from other people, it's, it's a shift in culture that um, I'm, I firmly stand behind and I want to thank you for that. All right, uh, all those in favor? Okay, moving on to item 11, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the student educational trip for the Cape Elizabeth Model UN to Hanover, New Hampshire on April 5th through the 7th, 2019. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Okay. Um, moving on to item 12, we have a slate. Um, that we can just refer to. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the following 2018-2019 administrative and athletic extracurricular, extracurricular personnel nominations as outlined in our packet. Second. Any discussion? Um, I would just like to say, as we often do uh, from the school board perspective, mine, um, Thank you for these faculty members uh, that are stepping up and doing this work. It creates a very well-rounded environment for these kids, which is so important. So um, I appreciate it. Thank you. All those in favor? Moving on to item 13. No vote required, but maybe... Um, Hope you can fill us in. Sure. So um, on first reading, we looked at four policies at the most recent meeting. Um, so Dell PV brought to our attention that the child find policy had a, um, uh, a time frame that, was, that we needed to have to meet the requirements of that policy. So we're going to update that to include it. It's a time frame by which the school district has in order to identify children who are in need of, of services. Um, the school property disposition policy, we're keeping the policy as is with a small, small changes to um, allow a little bit more flexibility for the district to dispose of, <coughs> we've raised a dollar limit before they have to seek approval. Um, recruiting and hiring of administrative staff, uh, on that one, uh, our policy and the uh, Maine State Management Association policy was pretty much in sync with the exception of a couple of references that were out of date in ours, so we're just gonna swap in the Maine State Management policy uh, to uh, meet the um, regulatory requirements, and then same thing with the student uh, education record information. So no votes required on those. And Great. should I just roll into? Uh, yes, please, roll okay. into 14. <laughs> uh, okay, so KF policy, this is for second reading and for vote. Um, community use of school facilities. Um, based on the history of Cape Elizabeth, which we were, we were given a, a pretty good background on, on how we got to where we are in the policy, um, we have buildings that are school buildings, town buildings, and they all sort of are run under one umbrella, and they've been at one point managed by community services, one point managed by the facilities director, and things have changed since the last time the policy was revised. So what we did was we looked at the policy and we said, well, the, the core <coughs> of the policy really can be can be better better drafted by use of the, the Maine State Management Association policy. So we took that and said, this is a good policy. It has requirements around um, you know, prohibited substances in school facilities, how you get permission to use the facilities. Um, and then it has a reference to, and use of the facilities shall be gov governed by the guidelines determined by, and in our case, it's going to be the facilities director. So we sort of take a, take a good standard policy refer to the facilities director who's going to then govern the policies that have always sort of run in the background for our, our, our facilities. So the, the guidelines will remain the same. There's still 
requirements around prioritizing school use for students, especially for basketball courts and things like that. Um, oh, sorry, so then relation with booster groups, this should read JJIBC. Um, that one, we also, I think Jeff Thorak took that to the booster groups. He took the Maine State Management Association policy, had them take a look at it, and there were no objections. Um, we're going to take, adopt that. Um, integrated pest management, this is a one that we are required to have. Perry Schwartz is recommending that we adopt the Maine State Management Association policy. And then finally, field trips. <clears throat> this was kind of an interesting one. Historically, our field trips policy had sort of evolved into a, a, a set of guidelines that were more closely related to uh, governing uh, transportation, and so sort of who rides with whom, how do, chill, how do kids get permissions to go places. So uh, on that one, again, we sort of reined it in and said, let's, let's go with a more concise field trip policy and take the guidelines that we had had in our policy and move them over into where they belong, which is rules and regulations applicable to field trips and also a transportation policy. So th those two will be worked on separately. So, um, so those are the four that we're looking to get approved tonight in the revised form. Do you want to make a motion? Uh, I move that we approve um, the revision of policies KF, Community Use of School Facilities, policy JJIBC, relations to, with booster groups, policy ECB, integrated pest management, and policy, policy IJOA, field trips. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Heather? I have a question on the relations with booster groups. Um, on M, it says booster groups will not directly pay coaches or officials purchase equipment or pay for transportation. Um, what is the process then? Because I know that there are plenty of coaches that are paid by boosters. That, that did come up in the discussion, and our understanding is the boosters fund into our budget, and then the school district pays. Okay. So the, so so the money they make. Budgets, we'll see lines where this money comes from the booster. Is that correct, Donna? Yeah, the booster, the boosters deposit their money, and then yes, and then it goes into our budget, and then um, we pay them through the school. Okay. So I yeah. figured that was the yeah. explanation, but I thought yeah. I'd double check yeah. that. It, Thanks. It goes through uh, HR, our HR department. Yeah. And that way, the schools are aware of what's being paid out e right. by the boosters, right. and they're okay. Yeah. I, I like. Yes. That's good. Thank you, Hope and Elizabeth, for your work on the policy committee. All those in favor? Okay. Moving on, committee reports. Uh, hope you're taken care of, Elizabeth. Yeah. Tech. Has a minute. Okay. Um, let's see, request for future board meeting items. Tina. Okay. Um, well, we'll see when it comes, but I guess the, um, the high schoolers who were here um, tonight, whether or not we'll see them again in March. I'm sure we will. Um, upcoming meetings. We have policy, it looks like, on um, February 26th. Um, it's also listed as March 26th, and both are at 3 p.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. Is that right? And then um, not included on the agenda, but coming up right after winter break is the second budget workshop on February 26th from 6.30 to 8.30 at the high school library. And then the following week, um, it would be March uh, 5th, I believe, um, would be the third budget workshop. So back to back. Um, March 5th from 6.30 to 8.30 um, here in Town Hall Chambers. So um, fr from, from people who are used to the budget workshops typically taking place in the high school, we'll please pay attention to where they're located because um, we're trying to make sure that everything is properly filmed and this the Town Hall has the best, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Machines, <laughs> equipment, <laughs> the best equipment to do that. So the, the first one on the 26th is in the high school. The next one on March 5th is here. Okay. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is um, a, before we make the motion, we, we're going to move into um, possibly executive sessions and then 
um, go in and out of that, and then we'll adjourn. So, and, and um, with that in mind, people probably don't want to stay. But anyways, may I have a motion, please, for the item 18? I move we enter into executive session pursuant to one MSR, MRSA, subsection 405-6A, for the purpose of discussing a personnel item. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. So we'll go into the joint
Oh, um, I'd like to have a motion to exit, exit out of executive session. May I have a motion? I move that we exit executive session. A second. <laughs> All those in favor? Thank you. You don't vote on that. You'll need to vote to no. move out of the executive right. session. Right. Yeah, you just move out. Oh, good, good, good to know. Oh, We're good. All right. <laughs> We're too moving. Much, too much We're formality. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. So. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, are we taking a vote? Yes. Okay. So, I'd like a, a motion, please. <laughs> I move this is a little we confusing. continue the contracts of Jeff Shedd and Nate Carpenter for two more years. Okay. Great. Second. Any discussion? Do you want to add to the discussion, Elizabeth? I see it on your... No, I just, um, I think for the, the benefit of the public, um, typically we would list those names ahead of time so that people knew what was on the agenda and we weren't able to do that this month, but I think in the future we will make sure and do that in case the public would like to comment. Yep. Thank you for that. I think that's a really good point. All those in favor? Okay. Okay. Talk me through this, Donna, because I'm confused. Oh, so we just need to... Um, so we're on 20? 20. 20. I move we enter into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA subsection 4056F for the purpose of discussing information in confidential records. I second. Okay, all those in favor? Out.
Okay, so now we're on uh, 22. You can set no. no Okay, so there, so there's no action um, following the, the just prior <laughs> executive session. So for item 22, may I have a motion? I move we enter into executive session pursuant of one MRSA subsection 504. Four five, five. Sorry, 4056E for the purpose consultation between school unit and its attorney. Second. All those in favor? Here we go.
we'll talk, we'll talk later. Okay, so um, there's no action required from our executive session. May I have a motion for something else? I move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? All right, thank you. Sign this. Back. Okay,